Well, I mean, something that came up, and I'm just curious what your thoughts are. I mean, we're talking about decolonizing um, the land and our, our way of um, our relationship to the land. But I just want, I'm curious, because I mean, you are, you are someone from North America and you're coming down to South America and you want to engage in these, I think really important and very beautiful ideas, but how are like people that are like there responding to you from basically an outsider coming in and like engaging in these ty- this type of work? I mean, how, how has that been navigated for you where you're being very sensitive to the people that are, you know, from there that are indigenous to that area? You know, and I'm just curious, like, how, how, how do you navigate that kind of, it seems like a complex thing, or maybe it's not, maybe it's less complex than I think it is, but how do you navigate that? I can't tell you. Um, I think it's, it's a very subtle and very important thing. Yum, yum. And what kind of fruit is that, by the way? Mm, thank you. Mm-hmm. That's a type of plum. Oh, okay. Um, almost mm-hmm. like, like an apricot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's not ready. No, nope, it's a little sour. It still tastes good to me. Uh, and I, um, yeah. So, so this question is actually of fundamental importance. Um, and there, there are a couple of aspects to it that I can start to unpack. And I, and we won't cover all of it because it's a, it's just a really big topic. Mm-hmm. But one thing is that the indigenous people were driven to extinction 300 years ago. Mm. And so they were completely wiped out in this region. They were also the last stronghold and the most fierce resistance against the conquistadors. Mm. And so, um, so it's a very interesting place. There is some of the culture that is still present here. Like I have, um, I can even show you, um, I have to walk and get it up show you a traditional textile of the indigenous people here because I just bought one made by a local craftsman. But um, so you can see that some of the culture is still here. See this here, this is called a mochila, which is just like a hand satchel. Mm, And it's made from a plant called fike, which Mm. is in the same family as it's in the agave family, like what they use to make tequila. Oh, right. And, uh, And they make these beautiful, this is a very strong fiber. And it's a bag that can hold a lot of weight and won't break. Mm. Um, so there, there is this very strong craft knowledge here. And some of it is indigenous. Mm. Some of it is from the indigenous people. And it's possible that some of the indigenous blood, you know, the genetic line is still mixed in with some of the local people. Although it's really hard to know. Um, but we don't really have that conflict of being on an occupied land with the occupied people still here. Mm. Instead, what we have is we have land that is a mix of country people, campesinos who have been here for several generations and people who are from somewhere else. Mm. So whether they're from the city like Bogota and they're Colombians or they're like me from the United States is not really that different. Right, right. We're just not, yeah, the local name of people here is Pati Amarillo, which means yellow foot. Because if you walk barefoot, the color of, this, of the clay makes your feet yellow here. Mm. Um, so the Pati Amarillos, the locals, would say that we're all, you know, extranjeros or people from the outside, if they're people from the city. Mm. But, um, but this is a very open-minded place, a very honest and earnest place, a lot like the Midwestern United States in that sense. <laughs> Um, there's very direct and if you're a person who's trustworthy people figure it out pretty quickly and they treat you well Mm -hmm. Um, but the local people actually uh, have a really big problem with trust and are always trying to cheat and lie and steal to each other Mm -hmm. and it's very clan based here so -hmm. if you're part of one family you're going to be opposed by another family because there was a feud you think Hatfields and McCoys (laughs) the local version of that here in the culture among the country people. Interesting. Just, it, it can be difficult to get them to cooperate depending on the area. Mm-hmm. Some areas they cooperate extremely well and others they cooperate really poorly. Mm-hmm. Um, but what's interesting is I'm not coming here as someone from the United States. I'm coming here as someone from earth who used to be part of an indigenous culture in the Mediterranean 
where my family was for a long time after leaving Africa. And I am a person who's, I am a descendant of an extinct indigenous culture. Yeah. And so somewhere back in history, I was part of an indigenous group because every human being is. Yeah. And so I've, I've approached this place with a very powerful but very delicate way of framing things. And that is the idea of the future indigenous. The future mm-hmm. indigenous are the people who become ancestors of indigenous people who come later. Mm-hmm. The future indigenous, you know, these are the people who learn how to live sustainably in a place and then have children and grandchildren, and the lineage continues, or at least the cultural lineage continues. It doesn't necessarily have to be bloodline specifically, because it's more cultural than genetic. And the idea of the future indigenous is it's the people who become kin to land. Mm. If I become kin to this land, then I am as though I were indigenous to this place. See, it's a very subtle topic, a very a subtle concept. Mm-hmm. It's one that can be very easily misunderstood. And it's also not a single generation phenomenon. So it's not like, oh, well, Joe arrived and helped build the forest and now he's indigenous. No, it's not how it works. But it might be that part of the culture that emerges from these reforestation projects becomes an indigenous culture. And then I will be part of the formation of an indigenous culture along with a lot of other people. Mm. And so the way that I'm being received by locals is this blend of deep gratitude. They see me as though I'm a campesino because they see me you know, taking a pickaxe and taking a machete and going and doing, going and doing manual labor work and getting dirty and having, you know, I look like a campesino. I'm wearing the dirty clothes, got the hat, I'm out there working and coming back sweaty. Um, so I'm, I don't look like a city person. You know, I mm. grew up on a farm in Missouri. Mm. I'm a country person. It's a campesino from somewhere else. <laughs> uh, but uh, so, so they see that. Some people see me as, um, you know, the, the indigenous people here were called Guane, the Guane people. And the Guane people um, are the ones who went extinct. And so I ha- sometimes have people who call me Guane man, mm. which is funny because we've only been here a year. <laughs> and it's because I'm really trying to understand and learn from the indigenous way of the Guane people. Mm. And so, um, so you see that it's not like I became indigenous and right. I didn't name myself this, but a couple of local people have started calling me this because they appreciate the way that I'm trying to discover the indigenous way of life here. Right. And so, so there's that. Then there are the other people who are from here, who are campesinos from here, but totally are weticos, meaning they are totally people who swallowed the poison of the sick conquest culture of colonialism. Mm-hmm. And because they own land here, they have played the land speculation game. And now like you might have a 70 year old campesino man who owns 50 properties. So he owns like you know, 2000 hectares of land. And he's just wealth hoarding everything. He's just a total like, you know, parasitic extractor of the whole landscape. Mm -hmm. But those are local people. So who's to criticize me for having been born on another continent? If I come here with the mindset of appreciating the indigenous and here are some local people who have this mindset. Mm -hmm. And so, and these people only understand money and they only understand um, narcissism. They only care about themselves and nothing else. Right. And, and you can see it, it's very clear. These, these are classic, like, psychopathic capitalists. Right. Who right. happen to have dark skin and speak with a thick local accent and they're fifth generation campesinos. Right. And so, so this is part of the reality of the situation is that it's just very complex and multifaceted. Right. Well, I get that, and I and I respect everything you're saying. I totally understand. I just was curious about the. This just seems like a comp, seems somewhat complex thing, but it's also very simple because it is really just about what you're there for, why you're there, why you've chosen to be there, and how you choose to participate in this. And I think it's it's like people can see that. You know, it becomes very obvious why you're there and what you're there to do. 
And um, yeah, I think, I think that becomes very apparent. Um, and, you know, and you did touch on things already, like about just like how you're like, what you're basically doing there. And I think you said earlier about how, you know, if we talked a year ago, we would be talking about things in a much more abstract way. But now that you're like there, your feet are on the ground and you're working with it yourself. It's like, it's much more intimate, personal. And um, yeah, it kind of, it's, it's not as abstract. And, and that's something I wanted to ask more about. Cause I, I, I don't know if I've said this already, but we've, you know, we talked about like almost every time we talk, it always seems to be about this almost global perspective on things like how, the coronavirus fits within a broader planetary collapse or whatever. Um, but I was just really curious about like what, what you're doing in Barichara and how, like what, like what, I guess maybe my question would be like, what are the specific things that have degraded the landscape there? Like what are the specific challenges that you and others that you're working with have right now in regenerating that particular bioregion? And like how, like w- not only that, but like, what are you doing to deal with that? But like, what, how does that fit into the bigger kind of picture as well? Because I think a lot of people are wanting to do work like this um, and don't know, really know where to even begin, you know, like what are like those first steps that need to be taken to even, do they have to go to, to Columbia to do that? Do they have to go, you know, I know every context is different you have to deal, like you just talked about the bureaucracy side of this a little bit. Um, so each place is going to be different in regards to that. Um, but yeah, I guess I just, what are the specific challenges that you're, you're facing right now, um, on the land that you're currently working with? Yeah. Let me, um, give a brief history of the land. Okay. Um, I'll keep it brief, but at least to give some context. So this is a place where three mountain ranges run parallel to each other. And we are on a plateau, uh, what they call in Spanish, a mesa. Uh, a very relatively flat elevated section of land that has rivers on three sides. So three deep valleys. And then there's a river system running across the top of the plateau, okay. which is where the 15 tributaries are. And um, the whole thing is about you know, 50 miles by 50 miles is you know, the size of this, ter- this area, which is 500,000 hectares of land. And what's interesting about this place is that it used to be primarily forest and uh, specifically tropical dry forest, which is that there's an, a, a distinct dry season, a distinct wet season. It's a migratory corridor of connection for animals moving from one region to another. Mm-hmm. And it has incredible biodiversity and also really high endemism. Yeah. At least I can't, sweetie, because I'm still talking right now. But I'll come whenever I'm done. Well, I can clean that up, but I'll need both hands to clean that up. We have a bird that's digging holes into the mud wall and leaving mud on the floor. I need to sweep it up. Okay. Um, But uh, uh, so this is an area that has high endemism, which means the types of animals and plants that live here don't exist anywhere else on Earth. Mm, mm-hmm. Actually, more than 70% of the plants and animals that are here don't exist anywhere else. Wow. So with the destruction of the forest, there has already been an extinction event. Mm, mm-hmm. And it goes back maybe 80 or 90 years ago, they started cultivating food crops, cutting down the forest to grow beans and squash and corn and sort of typical Mesoamerican food crops. And then about 50 years ago, it shifted to tobacco and growing a lot of tobacco, mm-hmm. which is really intensive on the soil, which fills it with salts, which drains it of nutrients. And then afterwards, as of about 40 years ago, big tobacco left. There is still some tobacco here, but not on the scale that there was for this, this big pulse of industrial activity. And the land was so degraded at this point that the only thing left to do is drop a couple of goats or a couple of cows on it, which of course increases the erosion, compacts the soil into clay. There's already no topsoil left just about anywhere in the territory. Mm-hmm. And it's 98% deforested. Wow. So the forest is almost entirely gone. Uh, there are trees, but there's not forest. Mm-hmm. 
So that's just a little of the history uh, and a little sense of the, the type of landscape that it is. Mm -hmm. So the kinds of challenges we face now are that body char is a beautiful like 16th century Spanish villa. And so it's a tourist destination. Yeah, I can play it's there. on the registry of national monuments for Colombia as a town. And it has 80% uh, of its economy is tourism. We talked about this with the collapse of tourism during COVID, mm -hmm. which started in March. And so let me tell you what happened when they opened tourism up in September is that we had chronic water scarcity. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it started raining for six months. And so there wasn't water scarcity until in the first week of September, they allowed tourism to open again. And all of the hotels and hostels opened. And within three days, all of the residents were having water shortages in our houses because all the hotels were filling their swimming pools. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so this gives you a sense of the kind of problem we have is we have a privatized water system, a lot of corruption, at least no more, please. I don't want you to do that to my hair, please. I know, but I don't want you to do more, sweetie. It's, it's nodding up my hair. Thank you. Um, and, uh, and so there's a lot of corruption and mismanagement of water. The water that is used for the town comes from a, a surface reservoir where they dammed the river, which mm -hmm. effectively killed the river. Whereas historically, before, no, I don't want it anymore. Um, that before uh, the early 1990s, when they built the privatized water treatment system, which doesn't really work very well, um, all of the town, all of the houses in town, got their water from um, from little um, like stone circle um, wells in their courtyards, mm -hmm. and they pull, use buckets and pull the water out. So they used to get groundwater to feed the town. But now we have chronic water shortages because the groundwater supply for those wells was contaminated when they created the, the privatized water treatment system. Mm -hmm. So now we have this water problem. Mm. And the, the biggest threats to the land that we have right now are that um, people from the outside want to escape the city after being stuck in their apartments during COVID. Mm -hmm. And so there's sort of like a gold rush of housing where mm -hmm. people are coming here to buy land or the, at least, sweetie, I'm trying to have a conversation. And um, what happens is um, people here uh, cut down all the trees and take a bulldozer and make the land flat, which just ecologically destroys everything. And then they divide it into parcels and sell lots. Mm. And then people from the city can come and buy houses and, or build houses on these lots. Now, the problem is that so many people have done this, that there are probably 500 pieces of land for sale. You drive everywhere and it's for sale signs all over the countryside. Mm. Uh, and these people are destroying the land, thinking they're going to sell it, but mm. they might not sell any of it. Just destroying what remains for the possibility, you know, it's just land speculation, classic land speculation. Well, that was what you mentioned earlier with the land you were looking at where the person currently owning it is just chopping down trees, just anticipating that that's what the developers or whoever would purchase it would want. And you're coming in like, hey, yeah. let's not do that. Maybe I'll come in and maybe we can work something out. But yeah, that's, in, that's interesting. Okay. So the, the issue seems to be around water. That seems to be a big part of what of the, the the problem. Like, is that is that an accurate? Is water, that yeah, water. I would say water is the unifying need. Everyone in the territory needs water, right? And so we organize cooperation around water. Um, the other thing is that the land speculation is a huge problem, and so. There are several elements to this that are interesting. One of the interesting elements is that um, there are a lot of people who would like to buy ecological houses that are in the forest, mm -hmm. but the local people here don't understand this. And so we're actually, um, I've started talking with local, some locals about uh, creating a green real estate company. Mm. Like who in town would like to be a real estate 
agent because what's happening right now is we have several friends here who are Colombians that have other friends from the city because they're Colombians from the city and their friends from the city are calling them and saying, I would like to buy land in Barichara and move there. Can you find me some land? I'd like something with trees. I'd like to protect the forest. You see, it's like this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so I have four different friends who have told me that they're just getting a, like, you know, last weekend, six of my old friends called and asked me if I could help them find land to buy. They would buy it sight unseen. Just if I tell them it's good, they'll buy it. Mm -hmm. So the idea now is if there was, if people are going to buy the land anyway, and we don't have the money to protect the land otherwise, then what if we could organize the buyers, people who want to buy land, and organize them into a network of forest, forest reserves? Mm. Right. Like where they can have a house on one hectare or two hectares of land and surround it with native forest. Mm. And then we don't cut down the forest to build their houses. We build their houses into the existing trees. We mm. put it among them. We do an ecological assessment. Mm. Yeah. And what this basically means is we could do like permaculture landscape design to help identify the best site for a house if a house is going to be placed there anyway. Right. See, so it's just a, it's taking a problem we can't stop. And, you know, and in permaculture, there's this principle that says the problem is the solution. If mm. the problem is speculative real estate, then let's try to turn it into speculative green real estate in the places where we don't have any other options. Mm -hmm. I don't consider this the number one priority for what to do here, but some of this land is very expensive, like $25,000 a hectare. Mm. And so this is not, a lot of Colombia is really cheap. This is one of the most expensive places in Colombia outside of the cities. And so, um, so we have to have really creative ways to deal with this. But this is just an example of how there's this very serious problem. And it might turn out that recruiting people who want to build ecological homes to land that's going to be sold anyway is a way of protecting the forest hmm. in those places. Yeah. So it also shows you the flexibility we have to have to not be ideological, yeah, but to just be very pragmatic and say, what is the best way to protect the forest? The best way to maintain ecological connectivity, the best way to build a culture of stewardship for the land, 